Yo, what is up guys? Coach Daniel here, aka Data Structure Papi, aka Algo Daddy, whatever else you want to call it. And today I'm going to talk to you about algorithms, specifically how to make sure they're using the optimal search algorithm. Now, these are the things that you really want to dive into so that you can ace technical interviews. I was able to interview at YouTube, Microsoft and Blue Origin and actually get offers from them because I was able to perform well in the technical interview. So what I want to do here is I want to teach you guys the things that I learned and the few things that you have to know so that you can make sure you can ace these interviews and absolutely crush it and get that job offer working as a developer at your dream company. So with that being said, guys, make sure you hit that like button so we could push this video out there and beat the YouTube algorithm. Smash that subscribe button, hit that bell notification icon so that whenever we drop videos like this, you receive them right off the bat. You get the notification icon and you can become an expert developer. All right, guys. Well, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into this video. So guys, like I mentioned before, I want to dive into algorithms in the next couple of videos because some of these algorithms are the fundamental algorithms that if you know and you understand, you're going to be able to apply and use when it comes to data structures. Specifically in this video, we'll be talking about search algorithms. So what a search algorithm really means is just a different way of trying to find a piece of data from a larger data set sample. Now, this is important because there's lots of different ways they could try to find this data, but you want to make sure you're using the most optimal one, depending on what data structure you're using, depending on how you're storing the data. And if you're able to use the most optimal one, then you can make sure that can scale over time. So let me give you a simple example. Imagine that you have a phone book, like the old yellow pages, thousand pages long, and it has all of the addresses of everyone you know around you there now if you're looking for a specific address for example if you're looking for algo daddy so you're looking for the d's then one way you can approach it is you could start to flip the pages through the book one by one by one by one by one until you get to the letters D's and then you start to look for the next one which is the DA, DAD, so on and so forth until you get to Algo Daddy if it's sorted by the last name. Another approach you could take is you can look at the side of the book where you see the letter separated, you open up the D section and then you partition that or you split that up and then you look at the next letter. So now you see D, C. So you would know that you would have to go to the left. So you get a couple more pages and then you flip to that point and you keep on doing that until you find the page that's going to show you Algo Daddy. That's me. Now, the thing about both of these ways of finding that word that you're looking for are two different approaches. They're two different algorithms to finding the word, but one of them is going to be much more effective because if you take a word that might be towards the end of the thousand page book, it's going to take you longer to get there. Now, not only that, what happens if this thousand page book ends up being a yellow pages of the entire world into 10,000 page book? Then you're going to see the scale of how long it's going to take to go up tremendously. So if your book goes from 1,000 pages to 10,000 pages, the scale of the input goes up by 10x. If you have your algorithm where you go page by page by page by page, that is going to take you 10x longer as well. And that is what's called linear growth. If you look at this graph here, I talked about big old notation and time complexity before. This is going to become really relevant when you're looking at different algorithms and the most optimal one. And if we talk about that linear growth, that would be like this line right here, which is big o of n so if your input size your elements increase by 1000 your time is going to increase by 1000 and it creates a linear line but if we look at our other example where we're partitioning the book in half every single time until we get to the point if my book is a thousand pages long it's only going to take me 13 halves to get to the page that i'm looking for so if the input size is of size 1000 it would take you about nine to 10 times to be able to find the word that you're looking for. So if the input size is of size 1000, it would take about nine halves, nine times of having that input until getting to the page that you are looking for. So if we look at this and we grew that input size from 1000 to 10,000 and we do the algorithm where we cut in half every single time, we're not going to experience such tremendous growth in how long it takes because now we're dealing, it's not going to be as slow as the other algorithm as the input grows. Because what happens is if you look at big O of log N, if your input is of size 1000, it'll take you nine to 10 times to get to the page that you're looking for. If your book grows from size 1000 to 10,000, 
it's only going to take you about 14 times to look for the page that you are looking for. So it doesn't grow by 10 X like the linear growth would. It only grows by a small factor, which that ends up looking like the curve of big O log. N. so this is why big O complexity is super important. And these are the things that if you don't quite understand, you could revisit my previous video where I dive deep into big O notation and time complexity. So by now, I hope that you understand what we are trying to do with this video, because there is different types of searching algorithms they could use to be able to look for things. So what I want to talk about now is the one that you want to familiarize with yourself the most. The one you want to familiarize yourself with the most and the one that's probably most commonly used and the most optimal in most cases. That's lots of most. And that is going to be binary search. So binary search, I already introduced you to the idea, but the word binary means you have two options, right? With binary search, what you're going to do is if you have a sorted array or an object that has sorted data, it's going to be very simple. You're going to go to the middle. And if the value is less than what you're looking for, you now have a new range, which is half of what you had before then you're going to go to the middle of that and if the value is not equal to that and it's less than that then now you have a new range of what you are looking for so each time it's getting halved and this is very similar to that big o log n curve that we're looking at that is very optimal and very quick so what i want to do next is i want to dive into some code so we can look at what the code would look like that way you can go implement it because the thing is when you're in this technical interviews honestly most of the time they're not going to ask you to implement it but they might ask you questions about it or you might have to solve a problem that requires some sort of searching so if you could point out that you're going to do some binary search here they're not going to ask you to implement it they're going to at least know that you're aware of it that you know about that you understand why binary search would be so important to being able to solve the problem in the least amount of time. So let's jump into some code. All right, guys. So what I did here is I got a binary search function from geeks for geeks. This is a simple one that you can implement. Now, I do want to mention there's different ways you can implement this. I wanted to show you guys with a while loop. You can also do it using recursion. I'm doing the loop just because for for some people, recursion is a little more complicated and loops are easier. So it's going to be very, very simple. The first thing we want to do is is we're going to set up a start and an end index. So what that looks like is whenever we have our array, we just want to know the index of the very first element, which is obviously the first, the zero index every time. And one of the index of the last element, which would be the size minus one. This is going to allow us to start to be able to find where the midpoint is of the range that we care about. Because in the beginning, we care about all these numbers. But once we start to partition into the half and we know it's in the lesser half, we don't care about the rest of these numbers. So we could get rid of those. And now we just focus on half of those numbers. And that's why we're having it each and every single time. So the important thing to know is our loop is going to keep on going until the start passes the end. So again, to clarify on that, if we have our array, we have our start index and we have our end index. Every time I check for the middle and see if that value equals is later than or greater than I'm going to know where I want to go. So if I have, I'm looking for the value of 10 and I see that here, the value is five. Then I know the 10 is going to be somewhere in the upper half. So what I want to do is I want to make this start point to where the middle was. And then we're going to choose a new middle one because we don't care about the rest over here. So we're going to keep on doing this till this range between the start and the end gets closer and closer and closer until it's on the exact same index and or it's on the exact same index or it passes each other. That means we've already searched past the halvings that we can. So the first thing we need to do is we need to see exactly where the middle index is. Now, this one might seem a little bit tricky because what if the array size is an even number? For example, if I have four different indexes, which one is the middle index? Is it this one? Is it this one? Well, the cool thing is it is up to you in how you want to implement it. So if this array is of size four, I know two is halfway there. What we could do is we could simply just pick the one spot. We could pick the one index or we could pick the two index. Either is totally fine. In this example, it looks like it might make a huge difference because it's a small input. But think about it. If you have an input of size 10,000, then you're not going to really care if you choose between 5,000 or 5,001, because now we're looking at a bigger input size, a, a bigger scale. For the sake of this example, what you find is we're going to go ahead with the 
the smaller number, which is the math.floor. So what we do is we get our start index, we get our end index, we add them up. So that gives us all the elements in the range that we're looking for. In this case, it would be all of it and divided by two. And we're going to round that down to the closest number. So that's going to get us the index right in the middle, or it's going to get us the index. If there's two in the middle, the lesser index. So once we have that middle index, the, first, the next thing we want to do is we want to actually compare that value to the value that we are looking for. Because in the end, we're searching for this data. We want to see if this data even exists in this data set, in this sorted array. If it equals, then awesome. We could just return true or return the value to let them know that we did find this value inside of this array. If it doesn't equal, then that's where the binary search comes into play. So what is happening here is we've set up our start index, we've set up our end index, and we found our middle index. We saw that the value we are looking for X does not equal the value that is in this middle index. So this would be like a Y or something that is not an X. So in that case, we want to see, all right, the value Y, is it greater than or is it less than the value X? Because if the value Y is greater than what we're looking for, then we know we want to go to the lower half. If the value is less than what we're looking for, then we know we want to go to the upper half. So we want to go to the upper half because the value we're looking for is less because the value we're looking for is greater than what's actually here. It's very simple. We just need to make this assignment our new start. And when this is the new start, we're going to run the exact same process, but now we're going to find the new middle over here. So we look at our new range that has been cut in half because we don't care about all the other stuff because we know it doesn't exist over there. And then we're going to do the same thing. I cut this in half and see the value in the middle. Is that the value we're looking for? If not, then we're going to cut it in half again. So these are going to be changing. And what that looks like is if the value is less than X, just like how we talked about. So if the value is less than X, then we know X is going to be on the upper half and what it is that we're looking for. So in that case, we're going to set start to be at the mid plus one. So we do the plus one because we could disregard the index that we just checked, which is the current one that we're at, which is the mid, right? And we saw that one's not part of the equation anymore. However, if the value is greater than X, we're going to go to this else. We want to push down the end to the middle. So we now have our new range and you just keep on doing this partitioning in half and half again until at some point they're going to cross over or they're going to be pointing to the same value. And that's when we exit the loop. By that point, since we never saw the value inside of the array, we know that that value is not exist inside of this array. So guys, there you have it. Now you have another tool for your toolbox. What I want to do in these next couple of videos is I want to go deep into data structures. I want to go deep into algorithms and give you the essential tools because the reality is you don't really need to be aware of all of them. You just need to be aware of the core essential foundational data structures and algorithms that are going to help you out with your job interviews. They're going to help you out in your actual job. If you understand these core fundamental data structures and algorithms, the rest you can learn if you need to learn it in the future. The rest all derives from this and what you're learning today. So what you have now is one of the best, most optimal searching algorithms. Now, of course, it could be more optimal if you're able to divide by three, by four, by more than just by two. If you're able to get rid of more things like that, that's optimal. But at least you understand the idea that if you're constantly dividing by a certain number of all your data sets and you're just picking the portion, dividing by that again, picking the portion, dividing by that again, you're going to get to your solution very quick. I just want to reemphasize that number again. If you were to divide by half every single time and you were trying to get a number between the one and 1000, that would take you just about nine divisions, 10 divisions to get to where you want to go. If you were to multiply that by 10, so you're at 10,000, you would only add about four more divisions and you'd be at 13 divisions and that's all it would need to take. But you were able to put a larger input. So this is why it's such an optimal algorithm, because if you keep on bringing that number up, it's crazy how small of a number is going to increment in terms of how many divisions you have to make. But like I said before, guys, 
This is binary search. This is going to be very crucial to understanding data structures, algorithms, learning the most optimal way. I haven't talked on big O notation, which if you forgot about, you could go check out the last video. But these are the things that we're going to build on to help you in your foundation, to help you crush software developer interviews. Now, if you're in the point where you're even struggling to get software developer interviews, then maybe we need to work on your portfolio. What I want you to do is click the link below because we have a special training for you where you're able to build an amazing amazing project that you put into your portfolio, start to get these interviews, then rewatch these videos so you could crush those interviews and land your job as a six figure developer. So go ahead, click the link below, like this video. Let's beat the YouTube algorithm gods. Go ahead and subscribe, hit the bell notification icon so that whenever we drop out more fire content, just like this one, so you could crush those technical interviews, you will be notified. All right, guys, that is it for this video. Coach Daniel, Data Structures Poppy, Algo Daddy is signing out. See you in the next one. Peace.